morning journey. <laughs> so, good morning, everybody. But first place, I would like, well, I can't say that I'm not excited. I'm excited. But it's the first time I've come to Maharahu in Britain. And uh, Gordon was friendly enough to invite me to come here for a keynote, which I think is really a huge honor. And I'm not so sure whether I deserve it. But I'm out of my job. I've been retired for three years now, so nothing much bad can happen to me. And uh, I thought I'd come here um, not to present uh, some findings on uh, the latest technology or whatsoever, because there we have really experts in this room. We heard a lot of good things yesterday. But I came here and I thought, well, what does a granny normally do? What does a granny, a granny do? You are young enough to know that. Yes, tells yeah? stories. Exactly, a granny tells stories. So I thought, well, I don't have any more students and anything new I could possibly present to you, so I might tell my story of my learning with Mahara. And uh, I got a good company here. Where's Sam? Sam? Thank you so much. I got that from last year's, uh, from two years ago, Moodle Mood in Leipzig, and uh, she came with her Moodle cow, and then uh, I got one as well, and this Moodle cow is now traveling with me. So, Mahara Granny goes to Mahara. Really a very big honor, and I hope that I can really get something over from my learning journey. And I'm very, very glad that today I also got students here, because what I was interested most in were the students, were the learners. You are, you were, and you still are my target group, because I always wanted you to give you the best and to facilitate your learning. It's not about technology, but it's about learning. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. So my personal, I think I skipped already one slide. Yeah, yeah oh, it has disappeared, doesn't matter. Um, I had the worst conditions of all to get started. Start with that. That was in 2008. I had already been working with Moodle for a couple of years. And I found that a big progress because before I was fiddling around with emails and and floppy disks and I don't know whether you still know what a floppy disk is so. and all that kind of stuff. I really was an early adopter with everything. Everything and I they used to call me crazy. I was always crazy. I was crazy to start with PowerPoint to have students do oral presentations with PowerPoint instead of oral exams in the normal way. So I really I I grew into that and was always the crazy one. So I had a very bad start because as an early adopter, there, are, there aren't many people around who uh, do the same thing. And then it's also very difficult to convince people. I think all of you know that. But times have improved a lot and you are a big network. We are Mahara family. So you are really, you really have a big, big, big advantage. So my personal development uh, showed me I started also with technology. I was, I thought, oh, this is cool. I can do this and this and this. So when I started with Moodle, I made them do the tests, the closed tests, so they had immediate results. And I thought they would be happy to get, to get marked and to know exactly where they are. No, they weren't, because this for them was not learning. This was just studying to test. So I had to change my strategies there too. And I had to put myself into the person of the learner, because the learner is in the focus. So what one advice there is we should always listen to our learners. Be in contact, get into the role of your learners and ask them how they would like to learn. So it's not about technology, it's about learning. That's how it all started. That was in 2008. I think at least one of these guys, some of you might know, because he's British. Christina, you know him. Yeah, it's Steve. Yeah, it's Steve Wheeler, and he's a learning technologist in, uh, in Plymouth University. And he's uh, a guy who travels around the world. He's in all, con all international conferences, the Eden Conference and whatsoever. 
And he's just brilliant, and uh, I can really, I hope you will go to his blog, Learning with Ease. So he writes a weekly uh, blog entry there, Learning with Ease, and he's full of inspiration. He's not only a technologist, but he is really for the learning, for the learning process. The other guy here on the left is Wolfram Büschel, and at the time everything started, it was in 2008, I got a phone call from the school administration or ministry, and they were looking for a person who was speaking English, who had some um, experience in teacher training, who had uh, some experience also with technology, and who was not scared about trying out new things, and who was prepared to put in a lot of energy into that. So there weren't that many people at the time. And I said, yes, why not? And it sounded quite interesting. Um, the person who called me was not very well informed what all was about. And it turned out it was a European project called MOSEP. MOSEP, which stands for More Self-Esteem with Your ePortfolio. So why did they set up this project? At the time, in 2007, that was in 2007 already, um, there was a European um, uh, agreement that every European citizen should be in possession of his or her own e-portfolio in 2010. There we are in 2015, just think about that. Uh, the only place where this has really been realized at the time was in South Wales, in Ponte, how do you, I don't know how to pronounce it, Ponte Disco University. That was a guy, uh, guy who was involved in this project. But, well, we are still waiting for this. And that's what I keep telling people. You have to insist that you get a Mahara installation, not school by school, but one platform where people can collaborate and contribute. So, 2010. Yeah. So, the, uh, the other guy here on the left, that was the project manager of the project in Germany, in Esslingen. And I was the one who had to work. All the material had already been done. There was a wiki created by, I think it was six different nations. Everyone had contributed. And it was like, you know, this, uh, there is this um, fairy tale with where you have to eat yourself through all the porridge ring around a place. And I was feeling like that. It was just horrible. And I had to find a strategy how to possibly implement this e-portfolio idea into teaching for various purposes. I had a bunch of 20 people. Uh, half of them had been sent, so also not one of the best conditions. And half of them were, in, well, let's say, slightly interested. So that's how we started. That was in 2008. That was just a drop in the water. You can't say it was more. I did this teacher training in Esslingen with these people. I had two sessions of about three weeks. And uh, there was also the, already the, part, the, the difficulty. I think you know this problem. You work together with a person. And I had no idea about Mahara at the time. Really no idea at all. No idea about the portfolio. And I had a partner who already had his own had his own Mahara installed. So he knew all the technical stuff. So, but we had very different interests. He wanted to teach the people how to use Mahara. I wanted to teach them how to use Mahara for learning, which is really very different. So that was not easy too. So my advice is, Get together with someone, but make clear what is your aim. Your aim is learning and technology it just has to serve. It just has to work. So we got over that in 2008. It was a drop in the water, and this drop in the water, I think it, I can say it has created, it has created circles. There has been an outcome. And it... In Germany, at least, it has become a small stream. Well, even uh, if we are not happy with a small stream, Christina, we would like to have a bigger stream. But I think it is a stream, and there are not just uh, very, very, it's not just drizzling water all over Germany, but 
it's a concentrated stream because people working with Mahara in Germany, they all know each other. They, know, they all know each other and they all help each other. So there are just, I'm granny, so I have children and grandchildren. And uh, you might have already heard about these persons. Uh, the person on the left, uh, she's from Brazil. She's <coughs> working in the Leipzig um, Language Center. It's Katja Eikobora and Arndt. She has done excellent wor work with her Portuguese students, learning Portuguese. Um, well, you know, all these people I met, I met on uh, Moodle Moods because I was the first one to present on Mahara on Moodle Moods. So I got people interested on Moodle Moods. To this morning I was suggesting, why don't you combine in UK the Moodle and Mahara Mood? Because then you get the people all who are already there for Moodle Mood, you get them interested in Mahara as well. And they don't have to travel twice. It worked quite well. So this is Katja. Um, I will publish the, uh, the presentation, and there are the links to these people in the presentation, so you can click on that. And the second one, uh, people who came to Brighton last year know her. This is Linda from uh, Padubice, from Czech Republic. I also met her on the Moodle conference. She got interested, and she is now, I would say, the Moodle expert in Czech Republic. She's doing brilliant work with her students, also in the Language Center. Lots of good examples there, too. The third one is Christine from Germany. Um, she also bought into Mahara on the Moodle Mood. <laughs> and you see, I, all, I met them all on the Moodle, on the Moodle, Moodle Mood. And uh, she's doing very, very good work. And uh, they are, she's in teacher training, and uh, she's working together with a coach. So this is the best possible start you can get with Max. So Max is a coach on learning, a German, Max Woodley. He also do, does keynotes and very quite famous Swiss guy. And he gets people prepared for different learning. So when they start with Mahara, they are already prepared that something is going to change. And their mind is already open, which helps a lot when you implement something new. And Christina, she's now doing teacher training in Hesse. We have all worked together. We did workshops together. And we are still in contact. We will meet again uh, end of November in the German, German Mool, uh, Mahara Mood in Kassel. There are about 100 participants already, I just heard, which is not bad. It's not an organized um, conference uh, where you have to hand in your proposals, but people come there and then they it's an open, it's like, an, like, a, like a bar camp. So this, these are my children. Here are the links. But I did not have a lonesome road. I had some very good company. And some of the company, I think you already know. The guy on the left, who knows him? Yeah. That's Nigel McNee. He was one of the first people working on the Mahara project in uh, New Zealand. And lucky for me, uh, I, was, uh, I was a Skype contact with me and he was always available when I was in trouble and when I, had, I did not know what to do. So he really helped me a lot, this guy. Uh, the second one, I think uh, she's uh, very well known, very energetic. That's Penny Leach. That's Penny Leach. She's now a proud mother of two children with sleepless nights. She's living in Munich. She has stopped coding uh, a couple of years ago. She said, no more coding. That's it. Uh, and um, she helped me a lot. And we did also workshops and presentations on Mahara Mood together. Nigel, Penny. Well, I think the third person I do not have to present. She's present here in the room. And I must say, since she, since Christina has been with uh, Catalyst, um, lots of things have changed because she's really, I think we really have to say that here, she is such a great community management manager and such a helpful person and so well organized. Well, I'm going to stop that here. And you really have helped me a lot, not only me, but other people, and she's pulling together people all over the world 
to do a good job. And then there's another person. There is Don Present. Who knows who has heard of Don Present? Ah, okay. I think he took part in one of the Mahara uh, conferences in the United Kingdom. I never met Don in person. Well, I had the chance, he presented for me twice online on a, on a Moodle conference in my Mahara track, so I got him twice online, which was nice. Very helpful, and he does really a very good job. He works with adult people who have to change, uh, who have to learn a new job, and how they can present themselves via Mahara. So I really recommend going to his slides. And then we have that lovely, lovely lady who's not very well today. Sam, thank you again, Sam. <coughs> you really, I learned such a lot from you and uh, what Roger just uh, showed us, the pages you set up uh, when you were still at Soland. And also, I can also recommend your personal portfolio collections, which you put public, uh, full of inspiration, full of ideas, and it's really just, you're really just a source of inspiration, and she's so helpful and friendly. So thank you so much. So don't you think that this is a very good company? So that was over the years. At the beginning, I was a bit lonely there. But I think still for learning, this is, well, then all dear colleagues who helped me, who did not block me, most of them blocked me, I have to say, because they, well, it was something new that was very highly suspect. So, okay. The Mahara community helped a lot. And I think that's, the Mahara community, in comparison with the Moodle community, is still a small community. So people know each other. And sometimes it happens at a conference that you are not sure whether you met a person already, a uh, person face to face, or whether you know him or her just online. Yeah? So very helpful community, we all know this. <coughs> but there is no learning without inspiration. So there are more people who gave me inspiration, but I just picked the three which I think really influenced me a lot. I think on the left, I don't have any uh, presence for quiz answers with me like, my, like Christina yesterday, but I, don't thi I think it's too easy. Who's that guy on the left? That's Ken Robinson. I think Ken Robinson, he inspired all of us. And already by the book that you, we have to do everything with passion, whatever we do, uh, in, the be in our element, which helped me a lot. And then uh, the YouTube, uh, the, the, um, the video he gave, uh, he, uh, the, the presentation he gave at the TEDx talks, uh, schools, are killing, schools are killing creativity. That is also an absolute, an absolute highlight. And uh, that is really all that is behind our learning. And uh, the third person in the, the second person in the middle is Dr. Helen Barrett. She is the Mahara. She really is the Mahara cranny. Or the, no, not the Mahara cranny, no, that's wrong. But the e-portfolio cranny. Uh, go, uh, uh, that's why I asked you not to put uh, e-portfolio cranny, but Mahara cranny, because I don't mm -hmm. want to take her position. She is really do, she's been doing research for many, many years. She's retired now, and she coined the word retired but rewired. And I think a little bit that's the case for me too. I'm retired but rewired. I'm still interested in education. So she influenced me with her theories, with her examples. And uh, the third is Steve Wheeler, which I have already introduced to you. And another important feature um, is even if you are creative, this creativity has to come from somewhere. So we all have some imagination. And if you remember how we learned, or if you look at how kids learn, how babies learn, yeah, they just try out. And if we look at how people, um, how our students use uh, computer games, Without imagination, they won't get anywhere. So imagination, I think, is also cru a very crucial point for learning. Um, this guy is a Italian friend's um, uh, boy, and he's a very pr he's very brilliant. 
He plays around with everything and learns a lot. Creative mind. Well, we cannot really learn this, but we can help our kids and we can help, well, this goes to parents, goes out, goes out to parents, and we can help our students in school to be creative and have imagination. I hope you teachers help you with that. Do they? Good. Good for you. So, I had, as I told you, I had a kind of hard beginning. Uh, well, I didn't, I can't say I felt like Einstein, um, who said, uh, I'm thankful to all those who said no, because then I had to do it myself. I would have preferred uh, to have some company to do it together. Um, my advice to you is, do not, if you want to change something, do not do it the hard way. I did it. Just get good company, similar mi people with same mindsets, who want to do something, who want to change something, and get a variety of people, and get students also involved. So the more variety you have in your team, I think the easier it will be to bring about change. Don't try to do it alone. Get networked. So, that's the, that was Einstein. So, that's how it should, like, it should look like. We, should, we, are all co we are already connected in the Mahara community. So this is a, good, a very good example. Whatever, whenever you need some help, whenever you need some examples or whatsoever, you will always find it in this community. So your students, they, you can give them a good example how to do that. Get them connected. And Mahara is such a great tool to get people connected if you use it in the right way and not in the restrictive institutional way I'm going to talk about. So always try to be open. The students, they are, I don't think we have to teach this to students. You are well connected, aren't you? You are connected. Well, how are you connected with each other? On the phone. Traditional phone. You give, you do phone calls to your friend? No. So what do you do with your phone? Social media. Social media, yeah. So you, you call it phone, uh, but in the end it's not a phone. It's a device that get, makes you connected. What else? How else are you connected? You mail people. I email. You email people. You use email. Yeah. Oh, do you hear that? She says she uses it. Who uses email for communicating here in the room? Well, I mean the normal way of communicating, just to say, uh, well, uh, well, because I make the difference between, uh, you know, the official thing where you have to keep records of what you were doing, which is, which is one thing, I call this business, and then the informal way. Who uses emailing for informal communication? Oh, still. Okay. Because you want to keep the records of what you were doing? Why don't you use WhatsApp or Messenger or so? Yeah, you use, we use all of that. Yeah. Now, what, I find, what I sometimes find difficult is, I know that, for example, Christina, she has written something to me. So I can't possibly remember. Was it WhatsApp? Was it email? Was it uh, Messenger? Or what was it? Or did she actually talk to me? So that's where we have to learn to get organized. But I, we don't have to teach to our students to get connected because they are already connected. We just have to help them to get connected in a way that helps them with their learning. Uh, and maybe that's where you might need some help too. So for all of this, we need a big step. It just does not happen by itself. We need a change in our mindset. And the change needs to be that big that I would call it a paradigm shift, even if this is a word that has been overused. But there is no way around. If we do not change our minds about learning and about teaching, uh, well, we might get all our stuff into the e-learning, but learning will not change. And I would say that this is the most difficult part of everything. It's easy to sell Moodle to a teacher if you tell him you can put all your stuff in there. So what will happen? They will put in all their PDF files, all their documents, what they have collected over the years, and they say, oh, now I've got a course, and I can use it. I can use it paperless. 
is that progress for learning? No, it isn't. <coughs> Nothing has changed. And they still want to bring their students, their, their, they still want to bring the students that, that they bring the te textbooks to school. So we have to do it in a different way. Another experience I made in my learning life was you cannot expect anyone, anyone, to do something you want them to do without doing that yourself. Whether using PowerPoint or using Moodle or using Mahara, you have to do that yourself. So what I did, well, I did not reflect so much at the time about what I was doing. I just did it because there was no one who could give me advice, so I just did it. So what I did was I set up my own Mahara ePortfolio at the time in 2008. Uh, you guys who worked then already with two in uh, Mahara in 2008, you know what I talk about, the problems and bugs and everything we had at that time. So I set up my own portfolio and I accompanied uh, what I was doing with the groups by reporting, by reflecting, by putting pictures and by giving examples. So if you really want change, you first have to be the change you want to see. Otherwise, nothing happens. That's hard, but it's also fun. And another thing I would, what, what I had to learn, you have to change your perspective. Don't look at the things the way they used to be and you are used to look at them. But be open and get into the perspective of your students, your learners. They have a completely different perspective of learning. Do you sometimes discuss learning in school, how learning happens? Mm -hmm. Does that happen? Yeah. Uh, and when does that happen? When you are unhappy with the learning and teaching or when your teacher asks you? Yeah. Can you speak up a little bit because there are some guys sitting over there? Uh, Ah, okay, so the teacher asks you what you were happy with and what yeah. you would like to change. Okay, I think you have to do that, do you? Because I, we had to do this in Germany as well. You get the feedback, student feedback and colleague feedback, and, and uh, teachers did that very, very reluctantly, I must say. It was just a formal thing in the end. No, but we really should listen to our students. And, uh, uh, for example... Uh, very important is that, uh, for example, if you talk about feedback, feedback is something quite new in Germany, so people are not very used to that. So when my students did their first uh, Mahara ePortfolio project, I needed another teacher to give them feedback. So the teacher said, well, uh, am I, how, can I, how can I correct that, what the student did? I said, well, it's not about correcting, but it's about giving feedback, about telling him what is good, what he can improve and there's a line for that and so on and we had major problems because this is a process not only students have to learn but the teachers and tutors have to learn too because when we learned to be teachers that was not a topic and uh, then it was introduced but it was introduced <coughs> top down so if something is introduced top down people they just don't want to hear that oh what i have got to give that feedback now well i've used my red pen so that's where i feel safe so the teacher's reaction were not very well. Change your perspective. And then let's talk about the ownership of learning. Another very, very crucial point, the ownership of learning. On one side, we have the institution, which is closed. Yesterday, I talked to um, Niklas about institutions and about universities. And uh, well, we realized that his university, for example, Every institution in the university has its own learning system, learning management system, own Mahara, whatsoever, so many. And they are all closed shop, all single institutions, no connections with each other. Well, this is 19th century learning, according to me. People have to be connected today, at least if they are in one university, even if there are 30 different departments. Of course, maybe one student is in one department and at the same time in the other department. So this poor student might have 
an e-portfolio with Mahara on one side and another one with iLearning or its learning on the, in the other institution, which makes no sense. So I think the ownership of the learning goes from the institution, and uh, this is also a reason that institutions, they feel quite okay by, with Moodle. Working with Moodle is something they can control because it's institution-centered, right? The teacher is in control. The teacher sets up the course. Uh, who uses Moodle here in this room? Ah, okay, so you know what I'm talking about. Um, the, the, te the teacher um, creates the Moodle course. You have a group, and the group, they have more or less rights in the course. If it's a good teacher, they have more rights. They have more responsibility. And these courses, they just sit one next to the other, like containers. Right? You can't see from outside what's in the course. And people cannot get connected normally unless you make a better course where they have access to different courses. So institutions in Germany, they are quite happy with this system. But when it comes to Mahara, to the learner, which is learner-centered, and which is owned by the learner. Yesterday, I heard a lot of um, questions, and there were requests. And some of the requests, I thought, oh, this sounds funny to me, because this sounds like I want to get more control over Mahara, over the students learning in Mahara, which is not really the intention of ePortfolio. <coughs> of course, don't, we must not forget in Mahara, it is the learner that is in the, who is in the center, and he is the owner of his e-portfolio. We have roles as facilitators. We can scaffold the learning, but it's not about control. We have to find different ways of giving assessment, of seeing what they do, but it's, we must really leave this um, uh, freedom to the learner because otherwise it will be another restrained space for the learner and they will not like it. That's what happens if there is too much control. So the Mahara in contrast to Moodle is really learner owned and people can get connected. So what can they do in Mahara? Well first place they can just build a simple hut and here I would like to talk uh, one minute about um, templates, which was a topic yesterday too, templates. I am not against templates. I think templates have their place with users who don't have the time to get into the system. I think templates have their place, um, for example, if you have very strict requirements that have to be fulfilled by the learners, right? like a, it's the form they have to fill in also, right? But my experience was, well, I tried templates as well. My students did not want templates. They said, no, if I use this system, I want to have the freedom of choosing my layout, my colors. And at the time, there was not much choice. So they would have been much happier now with all the skins and everything they can do and really set up a personal learning space. So at the time, they used... Um, how do you Photoshop? They used a lot of Photoshop and made pictures with Photoshop just to enhance a little bit their pages. So I think this has just led um, a life on its own. I didn't touch it. <laughs> so that's strange. Ghostly. So you can either build a hut to survive, or that's, I think, what our learners do, want to do. They would rather build a castle where they can change things, where they can add things, where they can use different materials, where they can play around with stuff, and where they create their own personal space. I can, I have two examples of my, I'm not showing examples of my students because they are, it's five years ago, so. So I had, they had to go to a placement, um, a four week practical training, and they had to do reports on that. Well, before I came in, they had to do the reports in Word. They were media students, media um, specialist students, so they were not really happy with work doing that in Word, and then I showed them the possibility with Mahara. They were very happy, they bought in immediately. And you can see, 
there was a purpose to start with Mahara. This is also very important. If you don't have a purpose, don't start with something. Yeah? Don't start with Mahara just because it's there at the university and say, okay, now we're going to use Mahara. Wait for a very good opportunity when they have to use it. For example, a practical training or a project where, it really, where it's really helpful and where it makes sense and where students can see the purpose immediately. So these students, just two examples, they had to report in the blog day by day and then they had to fill that with pictures and whatsoever or videos and podcasts. So I had one student from Bangkok, neither his English nor his German were very good, but he was brilliant. He's now a media designer in Berlin. And uh, I said, well, Sunny, you will certainly find a way to demonstrate your learning during the practical training. So what he did is he documented, he made a, do a photo documentation and outsourced this photo, a photo documentation in Joomla. Joomla. I, hadn't known, I hadn't heard about Joomla at the time. And then he just embedded that. Great idea. And another student, um, he was writing, writing, writing pages and pages and pages. So then it came to assessment. And the responsible, I was only the project uh, manager helping the students. So it came to assess, assessing what they had done. So that fell to the German teacher. Now imagine what happened. <laughs> Any idea what happened? The red one got, got a better mark. Yeah. yeah. First of all, he said, well, I can't read that online. I can't read that on the screen. They have to print it out. So he drove my students crazy. One morning I came to class and they were all in, a, in an upheaval and said, oh, now we have to put everything into Word, we have to print it out from Mr. So-and-so because he says he can't correct that. And they were so frustrated. Everything would have been lost if I had agreed to that. So I arranged that. And then I had to explain again to this teacher that it was not about writing a lot, but that there were various ways of showing how you learn something and of demonstrating how you learn something. That you can do it with a video or with a photo documentation or with podcast. Anything is possible in this, in this uh, environment. And that he did not, that he had to throw away his red, um, his red pen and just think of other ways. I totally would. That was the full catastrophe at that time. But fortunately, I had a department manager who helped me there and the students were happy in the end. And the student, and mind you, the student who had do, done the photo documentation, he got, because they had to, had to do a second practical training, he got a second placement, a very an excellent place in Munich for design. So, just to tell. If it had come to the German teacher, he wouldn't even have passed the exam. Um, does this continue? Well, okay, so building the castle, and it is really the builder who matters. Even if you give them exact tasks, give them the freedom to think about how they want to fulfill their tasks. They will find ways. I came, sometimes I just came in with a video about Obama on the beginning of the school year, and I said, okay, we're watching this video. Well, they had problems of understanding it. They had to watch it again. And I said, what are you going to do with that? I didn't come in with a plan. And they made the plan. They said, OK, we are going to think about uh, questions to interview this guy. We are going to find out the special vocabulary and put it into the Moodle, into the Moodle glossary. And there were about five groups at the end, and all of them were working. And I was just walking around. So you don't have to really be prepared for a lot of stuff if you give more freedom to your students. And if your colleagues tell you, oh, it's so hard work to do all of that. No, it isn't. It's just to get started and to get your mindset changed. Uh, well, we are already at the color of learning. Yeah, that's what I was talking about. So I can skip that. You saw that. Give them freedom to make their learning colorful. Um, is there, yeah, I just talked about that. Then we have, again, the closed building and the open space. Um, what about your students? Are they allowed? Is, are there any teachers here? 
or only university teachers? Okay. Are your students allowed to use their smartphones in school? And you make practical use of them. You're the big exception, you know that. Are you an exception in UK too? Yes. Ah, okay. So it's still common use that smartphones, smart devices are not allowed in classroom. Well, this means that students, they enter the school building and they leave the world outside. Because teachers, they are so scared that students will not listen to them if they have their smartphones. Well, if you lecture and lecture and lecture, well, what happens in this room? Everyone will look on your, on your smartphone. That's the same what happens with students. You just have to think of different ways to make them work and to make use of their smartphones. So because students, they will, if they see a purpose and if you give them freedom, they really will be creative. They will want to work. Then we have the famous culture clot. Uh, it's much easier. We all know this. It's much easier. It's reliable. You don't, you don't lose your sleep at night if you come in with a textbook and you know exactly where you are and where you want to go and where you want the students to go and just to teach knowledge. On the other hand, we have the meaningful learning. Well, this says Lernen statt Pauken. If I try to translate it, it would rather mean um, a studying versus learning. <coughs> studying is more like I have to learn something to pass an exam. And learning is something I have, I learn something to understand. So they are protesting in front of the school building that they want to learn instead of study. I like this picture a lot. So m learning has to be meaningful for them. That's the contrast between studying and learning, a lot of stuff we have to study, to memorize for tests. And on the other, star on the other side, understanding and construction of your learning. Now I would like to come up with uh, something that has also become a buzzword, at least in Germany. Has it become a buzzword also in UK? Competence. Competence-based learning. Well, we have to realize that we cannot teach competences. Competences have to be acquired by the individual. What we can do is we can help learners to get their competences in various fields. We can scaffold them, we can give them hints, we can give them material or whatsoever, and we can accompany, accompany them on their way of getting a competent learner, a competent, they need, com even if you go outside, if you look for jobs, they look for competences and not for knowledge. Because knowledge, in the end, you might look up. But competences, you just can't look up. You have to acquire, you have to have them. Um, Roger, is there any reason why this runs by itself? <laughs> ah, okay, well. Um, the edupunk thing, I'm going to skip. Yeah. Students gain the personal space on the web. Well, for students, normally the personal space on the web contain, uh, consists of various um, social uh, media things which they all aggregate. Everything can be done, if we do it correctly, in Mahara. So we have to help students with that. I have to speed up because I'm already a little bit late. So my claim is really, and that's what I would like you to spread the word, give more power to the learner. Don't be scared of losing control. Because if you give power to the learner in some points, obviously we lose control. And just see that the learners, they make good use of this power we give to them. That's the most difficult step in schools, according to my experience. Whatever you do, it has got nothing to do with Mahara or Moodle or PowerPoint or whatsoever. It has just get, got to do with learning, giving more responsibility to the learners. And then your colleagues will say, oh, this is going to be chaotic. Well, it is chaotic in the beginning. We all went through that. We all went through chaos, but we, at some point we have to accept that and then we try, have to try to get that sorted out. Even our learning, I think my learning sometimes is very chaotic. So 
Simon, you're smiling. Is your learning chaotic sometimes? <laughs> so, so the big question now is um, to get that connected to what we are talking about here. How can Mahara help with that kind of learning? Mahara has all these features. I don't think I have to talk a lot about these features because you all know about them. I just want to highlight the main points uh, to get connected with other learners. The first thing my students do when, they, um, when I started with Mahara and I showed, well, first of all, I show them the features and then we get started. So first thing they get started with, they ask friendship and then they make groups so they get connected they uh, send messages to each other and I give them about half an hour to do that so they are quite happy with that right? don't do that with uh, adult learners because well my experience with teachers they don't buy in on that because they are not so much used on getting cut well I think here in the room we may be an exception but you are the ones who've already been doing all this but if you teach or if you want others to join you, they might not be so enthusiastic about that. So, but students are. Then, uh, so the connection, that's the first thing they do. The second thing is the artifacts, that thing. Well, we all, liked, we all love to collect stuff. And I think this has a big potential for learning, collecting artifacts, because students at the beginning they would collect anything. They Oh, that's a nice picture, that's a nice video. And in the end, uh, their um, quota, their data quota is full. And they say, oh, can I get more data quota? So just look what you've collected. It has to be related to your subject. And this is a learning <laughs> thing. They have to learn what to choose, what serves the purpose of a specific learning subject. So there's a big chance for learning there, too. And then they have to learn that they don't cram in all the stuff they find into their Mahara site, but that they use external storage uh, spaces. And there are numbers of them. In the norm normally, students already know that. Then what students liked a lot when that came up was the uh, mobile upload from uh, the smartphone. And this is really cool because when they are, for example, on a, on, a, on a school excursion and they take pictures or whatsoever, they just upload them into, uh, into the Mahara and use them later. So this is something which is not really, it doesn't have to be there, but it's nice to have and it gives them the impression that they can be creative wherever they are. So I like that. So the collection. Then, very important, is the collaboration. Um, I really like that when we... St I don't remember when we had groups in Mahara. I think you guys know that better. Um, because in the, first in, in the first Mahara releases, there were no groups, if I remember right. And then we had the groups. And this was a big potential for working with students. Because, first of all, you make your work group. And I always insisted, you know, that they can keep everything for them. But if we worked some, if they would, if it was cool related, they always had to make it, and we agreed on that. Everyone agreed on it. They all, they all made it public for the group, first place, teacher and group. So, for example, for their blog entries, if they just did a draft, I told them just mark it as draft, and then it won't appear. So you have the time to work on that later. That is also a cool feature. And then they found out when they had to do some group project to work in two or three, that it was really, really a nice thing and a cool thing to work from different places at different times on the same project, on a group page, and then to share it. So I think the group, um, the group feature has a very, very big potential for our students. And I really like it that the students themselves can create their groups. Because this is another thing that teachers are worried about. But then students can create their groups. Uh, yes, what about? That's like in real life. They get together, three or four of them, and they create their groups. The most difficult process, and I never came up with this word reflection. When, yeah, if you have, I'm 
almost done. If you have the word reflection, throwing to your teachers or to your students, they get scared. And, oh, goodness me, now I do have to reflect about my work. I don't want to reflect. So I kind of introduced it in a smooth way. For example, when they had to write the report on their practical training, there was one part, there were five leading questions <coughs> they had to answer. What they expected from the company, what they expected to learn, how they liked it, and you know these lead questions. And this is the first step of reflection. And they did not know that they were reflecting. They were just doing it. So be clever with getting your students reflect. Just help them by creating clever questions that makes them reflect on what they are doing. That's easy. And then later they will get used to that. The communication in forums is another very complex topics and if you use it clever then it can be a big community thing. Uh, try to get your students, try not to answer all the questions the students ask. Get your students, this also refers to, it, it's the same uh, with Moodle because the student asks a question and then expects you to answer. No, don't. Get other students to answer that. And maybe you may create by this way a student, <coughs> um, a student tutor and give him, where's Alain? And give him a badge, Alain. Huh? I would, here, I would create student teachers and give them a badge for being a, t a student teacher, for example, displayed on their Mahara site. And then may create multiple forums so that they have a forum for everything. Then, to share the ach achievements, students want to share what they have done. They want to show they want to display to others. So give them the opportunity, for example. Give them the opportunity to show it to other classes, to other teachers, to at uh, the, the open day, the open school day. Uh, have them present what they have done in groups or alone or whatsoever. Make them present to others. <coughs> and I, I'm coming back for a minute to the qualified Feedback, feedback, as I said, is a very difficult topic, but get your students involved. Teach them. Make, well, I made five 10-minute sessions at the beginning of a class and said, okay, each of you is giving two qualified feedbacks, not, not just say thumbs up like in Facebook, like button, there's no like button, and I don't want a like button in Mahara. Um, <laughs> I know we don't need that, I think. But Give them qualified feedback. Tell them what you liked on their page and tell them what you didn't like and how they could improve it possibly. It's easier finally if you give this time allowance at the beginning of, this, of the lesson and then at least you have got them to do feedback. And then maybe gradually your fellow teachers may buy in on that too if they see it doesn't hurt. The learning process is going on anyway, anytime, and anyhow. So we have to admit that, and we also have to admit that we cannot control it all the time, and that we have to give this freedom to the learner. So, but I think after all I've heard, I think there is enough light at the tunnel, at the end of the tunnel. I've seen a lot of light yesterday, and I think I will see more light today. Um, I've seen a lot of light in Germany, even if it's still a small community, but we are growing. We are growing, and I would really ask you, spread the word, be active, show what you've done with Mahara to others, and get your students fighting. So basically, that's what I wanted to tell you. I just would wanted to resume with one last slide. There are some bonus, but I will just leave, leave with that. That's my advice that goes out to you, but I think I, you are not the, the audience. I have to tell that you are already connected, you are working together. So keep up your good work, and thank you so much for having me here.